OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Brought to you by Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for. Okay, I'm delighted to say we've got Dublin R&B singer-songwriter Erica Cody with us for our latest OTB Culture Hall of Fame. It is brought to you in association with Now TV, where you can stream every episode of the unmissable new show Gangs of London on the Now TV Entertainment Pack, which also has a 14-day free trial that you can avail of. Watch whatever you are in the mood for on Now TV right now. You can find our previous episodes as well on the OTB Podcast Network or on our YouTube channel. So just a handful of them so far. We've had Dermot Kennedy on talking about Gladiator. We've had Stephanie Preisner on talking about the US office. Kenny Cunningham talking about Faulty Towers was a good one. Louisa Harland was on to talk about Kamara. Lenny Abramson was one of our recent ones on Detectorists and many more besides. You can get them all on our YouTube channel at the moment. So Erica, we've had sports people on this slot. We've had artists mm-hmm. on this slot. Which are you really? Are you a basketball player or are you an R&B <laughs> artist? Oh, well, listen, they're all, they're all my big loves. Um, they're, well, music and basketball are about my big loves. So, you know, I can't, I can't really put either one of them on the back burner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you will obviously be far better known for the incredibly successful music career to date. Talk to us about the sporting uh, career and the, the sporting life you had. Yeah, so, well, I think it was inevitable for me to play basketball. My dad was a professional basketball player. Um, and he came over here in the 80s so yeah when he came over here it was like basketball was massive and um, it was the next best place to go so obviously he was sent over here after he sustained an injury and kind of all the NBA offers were off the table because uh, the stocks went lower uh, especially with injury and um, so he came over here Ireland was the next best place to go and then Fast forward to 1996, I was born. <laughs> um, yeah, and the rest is history, you know. It's been a massive part of my life. Um, I really got into, well, I was always juggling. Um, I was kind of one of those kids that was in everything, you know. I was in stage school, I was playing tennis, I was horse riding, I was just playing basketball. Um, but it kind of got down to, you know, it was really just basketball and music. They were the two things that I really loved. Everything mm. else was like extracurricular, either after school or something uh to do during an evening on a weekday and then basketball and music were my sole thing during the weekends um so yeah it was I love what basketball taught me I love the discipline I love the um I'm a really bad loser and I think I've always <laughs> taken that into every kind of aspect of my life especially when it comes to music you know I only feel like I'm as good as my last game I only feel like I'm as good as my right. last gig or my last piece of work um, so it's that, that's a great motivator for me. Um, but yeah, it was just one of those things that was like, I was thrown into it and I just had like this natural ability for it. And yeah, when I was about fifth, I, I started really playing um, when I was, as I was saying, like I was constantly juggling the two. Like I'd literally be going from like doing a dance class to going to, to a basketball match, literally. Mm. Um, so then, and that was like through the ages of like eight, to 12 I'd say right um and then by the time I was like 13 14 15 I was like I actually really love basketball and it was one of those things that kind of came it kind of came natural to me so I was like right let's just see where this can uh where this can go so I started playing at like a we had like our under 18s uh national cup that's like the big cup that you play for every year nationally um and then yeah, I it just I just kind of started taking it really seriously, especially throughout school. I didn't have time to go out doing what everyone else was doing in school because I was too busy playing basketball. I trained like two nights a week, then games on the weekends. And then as I got older, it got more. It became more of my life. Sure. Um, and I was still obviously, you know, I was still singing and you know doing all that stuff as well. Um, but then when I got to about eighteen, that's when I was like, okay, I started playing Super League. I was in college, I went to them to study music and I was getting to do the two things that I loved because my dad was always saying to me, he was like, well, like, if you want to go to America to play, like, that's, we can make that happen. Um, so I was going to go from my transition year and there was, there was just something that was just telling me that was like, you know what, I went to go and visit like my, my dad's old high school in the States, so I was going to go there. Right. Um, just for the year and then I, I just didn't feel like I was ready for that kind of commitment. Um, so I stayed here and then it was like, well, do you want to go to college in the States? And then I was kind of thinking like, oh, do I really want to go on like a division one or division two scholarship? Cause you know, if I, I go in one of them, it's like basketball has to be everything. 
you know, it's not, mm. I wouldn't really get time to be, to be doing music and all that other stuff. So I was like, well, at least if I stay here, I can go and get my degree in music. I can be around music all the time while also playing basketball and playing at a really high level. Um, so that's what I decided to do. I stayed here, went to them, juggled a hell of a lot, like probably too much. Um, yeah, so, so when I was playing Super League, it was like, okay, three, three nights a week, first of all, for training. Mm. Um, and then weekends were games and you could be anywhere in the country um, because the Super League you travel, you're playing different teams from all around the country um, so then once yeah it kind of just got to a point that um, I think I was 18 19, 18 I was either 18 or 19 but I was playing Super League for like two years at this point because um, I would have played up when I was like 17 uh, on the team but then we were playing in like a quarter final for the national cup. And then I remember just like catching the ball and then my knee went one way and then I went the other. And then it was just kind of game over. And uh, that was my ACL done. Oof. I had to get surgery that kept me out for a year. And it was really intensive. It was like, you know, you really had to just teach your leg how to do everything again. So that was like hop, skip, jump, walk, mm. um, bend, all those kinds. So it was really, it was really invasive and really intense. Um, and it just kind of, I just felt like that was, some sort of awakening for me it was kind of like okay my body is literally just telling me to stop I'm juggling way too much I'm going from gigs to training or from training to gigs um it was it was a it was a lot to to handle I think on my body too um and as much as I love the game it just kind of got to a point I was like okay I'm a big girl now I'm in college I really need to figure out what I want to do and obviously basketball here is an amateur sport so I can only take sure. it so far um, and you don't get paid for it. You really just do it out of the love for the sport. And I absolutely love the game, but it just came to a point where I was like, okay, I have to put my big girl pants on now and figure out what I want to do. Mm. Um, and then that was music. So that whole year that I was like, I think it was 2016 that I did my knee, yeah. And um, I took that whole year and I was like, well, I, I'm the kind of person, my mantra is literally just like every, every negative comes positive. Um, and don't sit and dwell on the negative. So I was like, right, I'm going to really take this year to focus on what I really wanted to do, which is music. Um, so I started writing loads. I was producing more, um, linking in with producers in the States. And then that's kind of where my EP came from, Leon F. And that was an accumulation of songs over the last few years. Um, so yeah, and then that's just kind of how the cookie crumbled. And now, now we're here. And yeah. it's, been a, it's been a whirlwind, yeah. What, what a sliding doors moment, you must think, that decision to not go to the United States was. Yeah, the, what was the decision? Yeah, the decision to not pursue a Division One team or something like that in, in the US. Yeah, for me, it was just like, I just knew I wouldn't, I knew deep down in my heart, I was like, I wouldn't be able to do music as much as I want right. to. As much as I was really good at basketball, and that that could have more than likely happened, it just it just didn't, it, just, it was somebody else's dream I felt, and it was, you know, I feel like, it wasn't for me mm. at that moment in time, especially moving my whole life to go and live live in the States. Um, I just, I don't think I was ready. I knew myself I wasn't ready. I didn't think I was even mature enough to go. Um, and I knew I had a lot of growing to do and I wanted to really kind of, you know, make my mark here um, while also, you know, trying to get into like the UK scene and the US scene or whatever the case may be. Um, and that's what was important to me was to, you know, was to do that as well and in the midst of that as well like my little brother was born I have a five-year-old brother and I was like I, I miss out on so much time with him too if I was to go and do my degree in the States and you know everything worked out for the best it really did. It's interesting that you mentioned you did all these activities as a kid all the different sports stage school as well yeah. as music we often have sports yeah. people on the show and they talk about how yeah. you can cross-pollinate so well when it comes to skills but it's not just down mm -hmm. to skills there is something there's a huge benefit to having all these different things going on in your life. Of course, once you reach your late teens, mm -hmm. you have to specialize if you want to be good at something. But I'm sure you look back in your childhood and say, what a great opportunity I had to be involved in all these sort of things. Well, that's it. I'm, I've, you know, I really count my blessings, especially with that. Um, because my mom and my dad were just, re they were really athletic people. Like my mom was a gymnast and a squash player, all Ireland right. gymnast and a squash player. Um, my dad was really into basketball. When I spend the weekends with him, that's what we did. My summers were with my dad as well, basketball camps all the time. Um, and that was, and then my grandparents were tennis, like loved tennis. So they were like, okay, hey, we'll put her into the tennis club too. And so she can, you know, get lessons and whatever. So that was something that I have to, you know, I have to really um, vouch for them. But they're the reason why I was, you know, so heavily involved in extracurricular <laughs> activities, you know. <laughs> it's so very blessed. 
Uh, we, we should talk about your father for just a, a brief moment here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gerald Kennedy. I oh, love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there, there's a, a great piece done with him in Kieran Shannon in the Irish Examiner two years ago yeah. because that was what would it have been the 30th anniversary of his buzzer beater in 1988. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the 74-yard shot for Neptune when they were doing their four in a row. He was an All-American at high school level. Would have been in the same summer leagues as Michael Jordan. Uh, they, they, yeah, so like they would, they actually would have played with each other a lot of the right. time because especially with everything going on now, it's like it's made me want to ask more questions. And then obviously when we mm. were, uh, the last dance, when that came out, it was like I'd ask so many more questions about yeah. that. I was like, Dad, like tell me more. Like I don't actually ask you enough of this. Like he used to always tell me when I was younger, but I didn't appreciate hearing it then. You know, I was like, oh, like he's such a dreamer or whatever, <laughs> which just isn't the case at all. Like he's literally like a walking history book. It's mad. <laughs> And um, see, I had loads of questions after that. I was like, yes, yeah, like, what was your relationship with him and stuff? He was like, we used to play, play against each other all the time. They would play summer leagues together. Um, he was like, yeah, I've won the first pair of Jordans in the attic that he gave me. Like, right. it's mad. It's mental. And I'm like, what? Like, you? Like, girls are over here. Like, how, how does that, like, correlate? It's mad. But yeah, no, it's really cool. It's really cool. Is it true that he toured Scotty Pippen around Dublin once? I actually, that's after another question that I have to ask now. It's, it's in the Irish <laughs> Examiner piece. You seem to know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, yeah. That probably is true. Um, it, is, it is interesting that you mentioned your father is a walking history book because I've always been interested in this about the basketball players who've come from the States to Ireland about how in touch with their roots they are and how accessible that is for you as a daughter of somebody who came, who grew up in South Carolina, a very racist South Carolina, not that things yeah, yeah. have changed. Did you have many conversations with your father about that in the past? And I presume over the last little while, over the last couple of years, maybe yeah. from Ferguson and certainly now in the last couple of weeks, those questions have intensified. Yeah, so like the thing is, is that I remember my dad having to teach me about my blackness. Okay. And I didn't understand because I was in a predominantly white community. Um, and he was the only person that, you know, would be teaching me about my heritage because, you know, it was firsthand. Um, but he never really got into uh, the racism that he, that he faced in America. And we still haven't really gotten into that. I've mainly been asking, like, my aunt, um, not even my, my grandmother as much. We did, like, a legacy video with her. And it, it was basically everyone was able to ask her questions about her upbringing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's it's really deeply rooted. I didn't realize how deeply rooted it was, even in my family. Like we, my great grandfather was shot and killed at a baseball game by a white cop. He was an umpire, um, all for the color of his skin. And a, a third cousin of mine as well, my aunt was telling me he was shot and killed as well twelve years ago, um, by a cop. So it's just, you know, it's re really, it's been a it's been a, a massive um awakening for me because it this is something that I felt so passionately about for so many years and felt like I was never I could never really have these conversations because every time I'd have them they'd be diminished or I'd be asked questions people would question what I'm saying on my experience and um, so it kind of just taught me to just kind of keep my mouth shut I suppose in a way um, but my dad would mainly talk to me about like the racism that he's faced here because this is my reality mm. um, and it's only now that I'm kind of like oh I kind of want to I want to get into it more um, on his side from when he was growing up and the thing is it's hard to even bring up because I know it's so especially in South Carolina it's like it's still so um divided I've, I felt anyway when I was over there um a couple of years ago but yeah I remember him literally just having to like sit me down and teach me about my blackness because I it was it was one of those things that was always diminished because people used to say like I was really heavily bullied in school like physically and <laughs> emotionally um it was yes yeah, so he they'd always tell me that like oh you're not white enough because you uh you know like your dad's black but you're not black enough because you don't live with your dad and like all these crazy things that i'd be like but i feel a certain type of way and i always felt like this closeness towards my dad's family too because you know i felt like if i ever wanted to speak about it they could they could relate and it wasn't a conversation that was really um here a lot of the time um, but with that said, it was like my nana and my mom were like always in, the, in my primary school. I remember for all it was always something. Um, it was always to do with either racial slurs all the time in school, being bullied. You know, people shouting monkey noises after every day in school. It was just, it was very overwhelming. And it's like my, um, I know that because my nana would tell me stories of her having to go into my school all the time because it was just it was unbearable most of the time mm. um and it's it's one of those things that I'm like okay if I can use my platform in a way that can highlight 
the racism that's actually here too. Like racism doesn't have borders, and that's what people need mm. to understand is that like it 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 affects us very much too, and it's you know it's very well on our shores, and I've, I'm sure you've noticed over like the last week or so that uh the amount of people that are coming out with their stories and um which is great because for a long time we haven't been able to come about come out about our stories and it was only last year that I started really you know opening up about it. I've been talking about it but musically when I wrote right where you're really from mm. that was like I felt like I had a weight off my chest um, and that came from a place of somebody asking me constantly where am I really from and it was happening in work it was happening bloody anywhere I went it was like it was just exhausting so for me you know being able to put that into a song was very uh therapeutic it's interesting because Gina Akba Moses made that exact same point last week when she was on the show and uh she said as an Irish athlete despite wearing the green of Ireland she would still have those questions where are you really from how much of an issue do we have in Ireland in terms of facing up to the fact that we still have a huge racist element in terms of our behavior Mm -hmm. People just need to want to learn. They need to, mm. you know, open their eyes to what we're saying. We're not saying this just for the fun of it. Like, this, these are our stories and this is the stuff that we have to deal with. Um, day in and day out, everyone's experiences are, can be totally different too. Um, I know for me, it was a weekly thing. Uh, some people face it every single day. Um, you know, so it's really just about, you know, being willing to learn and taking the information and taking the stories that we're saying because if we're this isn't coming from a place of um just jumping on a bandwagon Mm. like this is not a bandwagon this is like a real human issue and it's not just a black people problem it's it's a humanity problem for sure and have you seen anything over the last week or 10 days that has suggested that the view of white people is more than a bandwagon sensation that there is force for change and there will be a force for change either in the United States yeah. or here in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Oh, 100%. I think that's definitely going to show, um, you know, it's a lot more than just posting the black square. It's, you really mm. have to, you know, have these uncomfortable conversations with family, with friends. Um, because it's, it, again, it's one of those things that's like, oh, well, Ireland's not, Ireland's not racist. And it's yeah. like, you need to understand the, the circumstances of a black person in Ireland and when they tell you that there's racism here there's racism here it's not that's a privilege being able to turn a blind eye to it it's, but it's not a privilege for us to live it and um, so it's important for people to you know read up on don't take the word right privilege as a bad thing and um, just take it and use it and learn from it um, and see what, if you're if you're concerned over what it means google it you know you don't need to constantly be asking a, a black person or a person of color uh to constantly explain themselves or explain what this means or that means like that doesn't have to come straight from our mouths that can come from literally the click of, like the touch of a button on your phone um because the thing is like people of color right now are really tired um i know i've been last week was extremely overwhelming and exhausting for me not only because with my heart like ridiculously heavy for my family in the states like i couldn't i couldn't say i was okay because i didn't feel okay because i knew my family weren't okay um, to the point that they were like, I'm afraid to get in the car and go to work in case I'm just stopped by the wrong person at the wrong time. Um, my auntie told me stories about her literally driving through KKK meetings and praying to God that she wouldn't run out of gas or get a flat tire. Um, and this is recently too. There's just not as many there now. So it's, it's really alive. And I did, like, there's things that I didn't even realize um, in terms of like American racism, how much it's still alive until I really heard it coming straight from uh, my family there too. So it's a, it's a massive awakening for everyone. And, you know, I still have a lot that I want to learn. I want to read more. I want to learn way more about my black history because that's one thing I was never taught in school. Um, See, so yeah, it's, it's all these things. Like, there's so many ways that we can help try and, well, this conversation is not going to die. <laughs> as long mm. as I'm breathing, I will not let this conversation die here especially and that's why I say like I want to use my platform in a way that's beneficial and you know can spread awareness over this until you know we really do start to see change. Did you ever experience racism as a basketballer? I did once. Once. I remember someone called me the n-word and then that was it. This is years ago now. Um, I just remember because I was like looking at uh, old tweets of mine and stuff and I remember I came across a tweet or a status or something like that from Facebook but it was all the time. It was like it was brushed off because it was nearly like deemed casual. It's like no, like it's not casual. This is where it has to start as well. Is like calling out casual racism if you're in a group of friends, um, and calling out your friends or family that are racist. Like that's where it needs. To, that's where it needs to start, and it starts at home too. 
especially with younger kids. I've had so many amazing uh, parents messaging me and teachers as well that are like, I definitely want to take this into the classroom, the information you're sharing, or that I'm, I'm having these conversations, these uncomfortable conversations with my 10 year old or my eight year old or my seven year old. Um, because it's like, it's time to have these uncomfortable conversations now because we've all been uncomfortable for years trying to talk about this, especially in a predominantly white community where you just automatically think the worst that no one wants to listen to you after years of, you know, your experiences being diminished. It's very interesting that you mention about learning a bit more about black history. And I wonder if that should be, should become more part of our education in this country. That like there was a big debate last year, was it about abolishing history from curricula in Ireland? And obviously that was a ridiculous idea. And we often point to, yeah. yeah, we often point the finger at Britain and say they don't know a thing about the famine and they don't know a thing about Ireland and therefore they mm-hmm. can't appreciate uh, the attitudes that have been shown from the Irish towards the British over a period of years. The Mm -hmm. same has to be said when it comes to white people and especially in Ireland and in the UK when it comes to white people's view of black people because there is that, or towards racism I should say, because of that lack of education, the lack of understanding of the history of the subject. Exactly, and that's exactly it. I think the racism here is more from a lack of education and it can come from a place of ignorance sometimes. That's what I found because I've seen white America and I've seen white Ireland and they're two totally different places. because the racism in America is just so deeply rooted and that's what it's built on. Mm. Um, so that's why everything is going to have to be rebuilt in America because it's, it's so deeply rooted. Like you're talking over 400 years, like it's, it's insane. Um, but here it's more so, it's just a lack of uh, education and that's why I think it's really important, especially now that we can, we can talk about this and maybe open up, um, open up to like schools and stuff to add like black history to, to curriculums, especially for leaving their students, I think is really important. Um, because like, I remember, you know, doing history in school and none of it was about, you know, where I came from and, I, you know, it leaves, it leaves you confused, especially when you're mixed race, you feel like you're, you're stuck in the middle. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a weird one. It's a weird one, but I, th- I think it's mainly down to ignorance in some cases and lack of education um, and this has definitely been a massive eye-opener to people you know coming to to either my Instagram or whatever and you know just saying look I don't want you ex- I don't want you to explain I just want to thank you for opening my eyes and that you know I'm reading I'm educating myself and I'm signing petitions I'm donating and I'm, I'm talking to my family and friends about this mm. and that's what that's what's really important too so that's that's where it all starts. For sure. And it's great to see a platform being used in such an amazing way because like, there, we have tons of these conversations as well uh, and about sports people too when it comes to using yeah. a platform or like, what, is, like, what is the compelling reason to use your platform? Should you be compelled to use your platform? And it's funny that we've been chatting about Michael Jordan for the last little while and how that was such a big mm-hmm. question around him when yeah. Republicans buy sneakers too was the quote of the early 90s. Yeah, At the yeah, same yeah. time, a, a white person around that time wouldn't have got nearly the amount of questions about them were they apolitical. Michael Jordan may just mm-hmm. be apolitical. I'd be interested to get your view on that. Um, just, like in terms of what's going on now, because actually what's funny is that I saw the same Irish sports star. Um, he put up a tweet and it said, he was like, right, just waiting on Tiger now to say something. And it just it just really hit a nerve with me because I was like, I'm not waiting on my black legends and black heroes to come out and speak about this. They're so tired. They're tired too, just because they're on a pedal still and you know, they're these icons. You shouldn't be sitting here waiting for them to come out and say something that invo- that has been so deeply rooted within the country that they live in, but also with them. Um, and that was one thing that I could, it just didn't sit well with me at all. And that's that's important to understand as well as that like you shouldn't you shouldn't be waiting on a black person to come out and no matter what their status is to come out and say something mm. about what's going on because I know for me it was it was a really really this is just me personally to give you perspective it was a really exhausting week it was right like non-stop crying all day every day for the whole week um getting on the phone to my aunts in America and literally we'd open the phone and it was just crying we'd have to cry first before we could even speak um and it was just it's it's just one of those things that's like please don't wait on black people to to have to share this hurt all the time especially when it comes to a modern day lynching like with george floyd and um, that that was heavy on a whole nother level so it's easy to that's again it comes down to privilege you know these say oh just waiting on michael now mm. but try and understand um the hurt and the pain 
you, you can never fully feel it or understand it, especially if, you know, you're not um, a person of colour. But you can feel outraged, especially after watching that video. Like, if you're a human being and you watch that video, you know there's something really wrong um, and wrong with racism. And it's just opened up the whole conversation. So it's just important to know that, like, look, um, just because your favourite black sports star hasn't come out and said anything yet in the wake of this modern day lynching, like, don't sit here and wait. Don't be waiting by your phone to hear something because it takes time and it's not easy to talk about. It's it's like it's like literally pouring salt in an old wound because I know even for me it's brought up so much um so much trauma from the stuff that I dealt with in school that I never actually got to deal with. Um because I felt like I couldn't really talk about it. I couldn't talk about my mom and my my dad and my grandparents or whatever the case because they were they they were there, you know, they could they could see the hurt because they were my family. But was, as far as it went, it was like everything else became diminished, you know, I didn't have I shouldn't be crying over what I went through. So that's where, you know, I think it's a, that's an important um, look to have on things like that, especially. One of the last things I wanted to touch on on this from an Irish perspective is our incredible ability in this country to turn a blind eye to this. That's it, it mm-hmm. frustrating. It's a, like, I mean, there was a headline in the Sunday Independent at the weekend saying there's no racism here and we white Irish people are saying it again and again, which is the, obviously the tongue-in-cheek way about how we're all in mm-hmm. denial about this. Are you yeah. going to hope that things are, are changing a little bit? Like, to use this case, I mean, the, the versatile story has been very, very interesting. Yeah. That this is not yeah. a new story. Anybody who uh, knows their music and knows their Irish music knows that this is not a new story. However, mm-hmm. this has exploded into the mainstream media over the past two weeks. Yeah. Does that in a certain way give you hope that people are no longer going to tolerate not just implicit racism, because this is not implicit, but perhaps yeah. more insidious versions that aren't exactly on the surface? Uh, 100%. And I think that it gives me hope because we're still such a young country. I'm seeing what we've achieved in the last five years with, with the referendums we've had, especially. Mm. It goes to show that, you know, we, we do want change. Um, and most of us are really willing and ready for change. So it's important, um, it, it, it's important to keep having this conversation because it's not, it's not one of those things that's just going to die down now, especially that everyone feels comfortable to share their stories and their experiences. I think sometimes it takes um, an Irish person to know a black person to actually understand what they're going through, to hear their experiences of what they've gone through. So I think it's important now, especially with Louise O'Neill, like I have to thank her for handing over her column space so I could tell my story. Um, and reach out to the next person so I think that's that's the kind of momentum we need and like in regards to like the versatile stuff I was calling them out on that stuff last year mm. and nothing was done about it there was no apologies there was no pulling them down off the website um, and it takes for something like this to happen for people to be like oh this is actually really bad mm. you know it's like this was bad for a long time and it was just being um, people were just being complicit to it but there's no there's no room for complicity now at all um, it's either you're anti-racist or you're not. Um, it's it's plain and simple. It's like if you don't, if racism doesn't sit well with you, what what are you gonna do to become anti-racist and make sure that you that nobody else has to experience it again? Like, are you gonna step up for someone if you see it happening in public? That's where it starts too. And yeah. um, because a lot of the time, it's like when you do shout at someone after they call you the N word or whatever, it's like then you're the person who's looked at, not them. Mm. And there's been so many situations with, with that. A friend of mine, uh, Jane, she put up on her Instagram as well. And she was like, I looked like the crazy person because he called me the N-word. And I was the one who was screaming at him for calling me that. And nobody said anything. Not one person. So that's where it starts too. It's like, I know it's kind of awkward and you don't want to do it in front of your friends. A lot of, with, with the case of some people. But it's like, there's, there comes a time and a place where things can be tolerated and they can't. Um, so do you know what I mean? It's like it's just it's just that simple. How do versatile lyrics and their blackface go so long without getting this level of outrage? Uh, is one question. Is it because people feel that because they are not the person who have written those lyrics or not performing those lyrics, they feel that they aren't partaking in it, even though they say bought a ticket to see them or have or listen mm. to them on Spotify? I don't. I don't know. Mm. I'd, I'd just love to hear your take on that. That's a good question. I don't know how it's gone on this long. Mm. Because I know when I see someone in blackface, I don't think it's funny. Um, and I know a lot of people in this country know what blackface is. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not. It's, it's not an excuse to say I was so young and I didn't know what blackface was. And you're 17 and you're dressing up as EDE. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm. I don't know. 
And especially when you're a guest in a culture, that's what annoys me is that like, understand where the genre that you're sitting in right now, where it comes from. Um, and it wasn't made for this. It wasn't made so you could fetishize and dehumanize a black woman in an art form that is created by black folk. Mm. Um, so when you're a guest in a culture, it comes with a certain amount of respect you have to give back to that culture. And if anything, they've been disrespecting this culture for a very long time. And that came with a post that they posted to George Floyd. And it was the biggest load of, I could say whatever curse words right now, but I won't. Um, and reading that was like, okay, you actually really don't care. You really don't care. This is for your own game. The fact you can silence black people in your comments and, and delete their comments when they spark outrage over a really disrespectful post from a man who just lost his life from having a white policeman's knee on his neck. That does not sit well with me either. And then to, for an apology, apology to come out a week later saying that this is just a part of the characters that we play um I was really young I didn't know I could literally I could try and quote the whole thing and I'd honestly just be wasting my time but mm. that's what it was it was a waste of time and it was a PR stunt and it's really it's still really disrespectful and for me it was when I was reading it I was like oh you're just saying this because you don't want to get kicked off the Snoop Dogg show when in reality it's an absolute joke you're put on the bill in the first place with the lyrics that you have to open it just goes to show there was actual there probably wasn't any um thought that really went into putting them on the bill they just saw numbers and they put them on the bill and mm. that was it they saw they sold as three arena and put them on the bill and that was it because you know when you when you google uh irish hip-hop they're the first people who come up and that's not what we stand for at all and that's not what the what the, what the scene here stands for either there's some really good hip-hop and a lot of those include white irish rappers too including kojak and rushes yeah. and everything else like there's so many amazing other places that you can be looking that would be much better to be selling out a three arena than those misogynistic, homophobic, and racist lyrics. Um, because at the end of the day, there's people that are buying into that, singing back to that, and that does no good. That's a really young, impressionable audience. Um, so it'd be better if they tried to use the privilege they have right now with their with their audience to try and educate them instead of saying that like, oh yeah, we're sorry or whatever. We were real young. Like that's that's bullshit. Do you know what I mean? It's not. That's just not it. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, right, try and make a real change. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation because I should mention the OTB Culture Hall of Fame is brought to you in association with Now TV, where you can stream every episode of the unmissable new show Gangs of London on the Now TV Entertainment Pass, which also has a free trial for 14 days that you can avail of. You can watch whatever you're in the mood for now on Now TV. This is the OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Our guest every week has the opportunity to put a piece of art into the Culture Hall of Fame. Oh, there's a book. Well, there's obviously Don't Touch My Hair by Emma Jabiri, mm. and there's a non-fiction one that's kind of in the... I haven't read it yet. I've just heard lots of great things about it, and it's called Queenie. Um, so yeah, there are two, two books I definitely recommend um, for people to listen to if they want to, well, read. <laughs> Whether it's an audio book or read, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd highly recommend them. Brilliant. Well, there's some fantastic recommendations. Before we let you go, Erica, we should chat uh, about music. How mm -hmm. have the last three months been for somebody who survives in gigs, or at least that's your bread and butter when it comes to revenue? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's been, obviously, it's been very tough, taking a hard hit to the, to the live industry here, especially. Um, it's given me a lot of time to, you know, just kind of, because you get so caught up in, you know, what's next, when's the next release, and all that kind of stuff. It just, this obviously just made the world stop. Um, and it kind of, as a creative, your brain doesn't really stop. So at least this, it's been, it's been great for, to, to try and write more, I suppose, but obviously not without having to put pressure on myself because I don't have sure. deadlines to meet or whatever. Um, so it's kind of just been able to get back to, you know, things that I've actually loved to do that now that I've time to do it. Um, well, also giving me that space. Like, I think I needed that space because I, I became so like, oh, I need to write, I need to do this, I need to do that. When in reality, it's like, that's, I'm not going to get anything, any good mm. song out of putting pressure on myself like that. So at least being able to be given the time to do things that I enjoy, whether it's playing a game on my computer or going for a walk with my dogs or things that I just really haven't had a chance to do because I'm so busy, have given me the space to, the, that creative space to gain that back. Um, because obviously, it's, it's like when you're locked in your house for three months, you know, there's only so much you can be inspired by. You know, I get inspired by life experiences and going out and 
you know, meeting new people. I'm a real people person. I love meeting new people. So that's been really hard uh, in terms of my creativity and all that. But there's, with everything that's happened in the last uh, couple of weeks, it's been like, ding, I've nothing but things to talk about now. Right. Um, it's just taken two and a half months. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's remarkable even the new Run the Jewels album, which is an unbelievable turnaround time to include mm-hmm. a lot of what's happened in recent weeks and to get that out so quickly. Like we were yeah. all sitting here thinking, we can't wait for the COVID-19 creative boom. Forget that. It's going to be about a creative boom that's going to be way bigger than this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, to be honest, the ones that I that I made myself right in quarantine are like the garbage. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't <laughs> want to put them out. It was something that I was like, oh, yeah, this could be like a cute little quarantine song. And it's just not it at all. Do you know? So I think I'm back to back to where I started as in like the music that I want to make. And that's about like my struggles and, you know, where my heart really lies. Sure. Um. So yeah, that's obviously the last like week has sparked a lot of inspiration. It's made me want to talk a lot more, especially having spoken about it on TV and radio and in news and the newspaper is like, hey, we're actually being heard this time. Like back when I released Where You're Really From, I was only heard from a minority and that was my minority. Um, but now it's like, hey, everyone's listening. Mm. Um, yeah, so there's a lot I want to say. Yeah, great stuff. And any yeah. sign of getting back on stage again? Like we're talking in sport a lot at the moment about trying to get people back into stadiums, but we're talking maybe quarter capacity, maybe half capacity if the two meter rule is reduced. But yeah, I presume yeah. most gigs in Dublin need full capacity to even make it worthwhile financially. Exactly. That's the thing. And it's like from a from an artist perspective, like you make your money off the ticket sales too and mm. singing your music live. Um so that would that would definitely hit hard. It's one of those things it's just everything's so unsure. Like I'm dying to do a gig again, yeah. but like, you know, I also want everyone to be safe. Um, so it's it's just one of those things we're just gonna have to see how it goes. Um, and maybe see I know there's been like a lot of like online live concerts and stuff, but like there's nothing like getting up and singing in front of a a full crowd of people mm. um instead of numbers behind a phone. So we're just gonna have to wait and see how it goes. Like of course I'll jump at the opportunity when it's safe to do so. Um but for now I think it's, it's important for everyone to, you know, stay safe and um keep your distance, I suppose. Yeah, I guess so. Well yeah. uh, fingers crossed that things keep trending in the right direction and we'll be able to go see you again sometime soon. I, I should mention you've been watching know, the o- hopefully hopefully you've been watching the OTV Culture Hall of Fame, which is brought to you in association with Now TV, where you can stream every episode of the unmissable new show Gangs of London on the Now TV Entertainment Pass, which also has a 14 day free trial that you can avail of. Watch whatever you're in the mood for on Now TV now. Eric Cody, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a million. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate that. Thank you. The OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Brought to you by Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for.